Ed says I should just introduce myself. Uh, so uh, I'm Cal Ross Kelly. My lab's on the third floor of the LSI. I really apologize. I'm not going to talk about blood. Uh, I hear Coda didn't talk about blood last week either. Um, uh, but we're going to talk about um, a, little, a glycopeptide that sticks up out of tumor cells uh, that we've been interested in targeting and trying to figure out uh, if that alteration on this peptide, it's actually a mucin that you've all heard about before that I'll tell you about in a second, um, whether this alteration is functionally important. And so uh, Aaron Bell, who's a postdoc in the lab, uh, is going to tell you a little bit about that in a few minutes. And um, we're also trying to figure out what regulates it, what turns it on and off. And Aiden, who is one of the CBR LSI summer students, who's down here, is going to tell you a little bit about our strategy and what he's trying to do this summer uh, to look at that. All right. And do the acknowledgements first, so we don't forget. So this is really a long time collaboration between my lab and a member of the CBR that you all know, Kelly McNagney, who, and Mike's here. Uh, Mike Hughes is here from his lab. Um, I don't know if anybody else is here, Mike. I don't miss anybody. I don't see Julianne. Um, and so we've been working on this project together for a long time. And Aaron and Aiden are going to talk. Uh, Pam Dean's done a lot of the work um, as well, who's here. And uh, Lydia, who's just joined the lab. And some of you'll know Marsha, um, who's now in microbiology, a faculty member there, who did a lot of the, uh, the initial characterization. And um, anybody who gets stuff sectioned or stained, I'm sure knows Aruna, um, who I taught how to make sections and stain sections. And then he went off and started you know, working in the company. And now, uh, uh, now I pay him to <laughs> section tumors and stuff. Okay. Kelly's lab, Mike's done a huge amount of the work. So some of what I'm going to show you today is stuff that Mike Hughes has done. And Julianne, who's in Kelly's lab, is a postdoc at the moment. Um, and Janet Wu, who's a graduate student who's joined them there. But uh, Diana, who you all know well and who's actually talked in front of the CBR group of, before about some of this work, so someone's going to be familiar. And Kim, Kim Snyder, who've gone off to work in biotech uh, now. And uh, Julie Nielsen and Marsha did a lot of the initial work together between the two labs. And Julie's now at the Dealey Center, the Cancer Center in Victoria, working with that big group with Brad Nelson. Lots of folks have helped us along the way. And most recently we're working with uh, Simon Wisnoski. So Simon is a glycobiologist whose lab is across the street in pharmaceutical sciences, uh, a pretty new faculty member. And he's uh, got some nice CRISPR libraries that we've, we're taking advantage of that you'll hear about in a few minutes. And then other folks, we made, we made some antibodies that you'll hear about. And that was done back before Admary was Admary when it was the CDRD across the street. And it was really John Babcook's group that really did this uh, together with us and for us. And folks like Chris Bond and Ishmael and Patrick helped out. A bunch of clinical collaborators because um, we have some clinical correlation data initially started with Karen Gelman, who's a, a breast oncologist in town and uh, pathologists like David Huntsman, Blake Chilks and Martin, and more recently, David Schaefer, um, the folks at the top, mostly um, breast and, and gynae tumors, but more recently we're working on pancreatic tumors. Uh, some of the glycobiology, uh, Ola Blixt has a group in, in Copenhagen that helped us characterize this little glycopeptide I'm going to tell you about. And uh, Stefan, um, uh, the LSI informatics core has really worked a lot with Aaron for some of the characterization of the phenotypes. Okay, so that I'm not Russian at the end. So what are we talking about here? So we're talking about this molecule that Kelly's told you about tons, I'm sure. It's a CD34 related mucin. So it's in that CD34 family and the molecule is called potocolixin. And the reason it's called potocolixin, it was really initially characterized in podocytes in the kidney. And um, a long, long, as Don McLean would say, Ed, a long, long time ago, I can still remember when I first heard Kelly talk about this. But what I can't remember exactly is whether or not it was a CBR talk. So I went back and I couldn't remember when did CBR exactly start? Back when Ed and some of you here were first in, in CBR. And I, I realized it was 2002. It was a few years before we moved into this building. And that was right around the time when I heard Kelly talk about potocolics and I went to him to ask him about tumors. So I checked 
And there's actually pictures of these people. And I don't know if you're in this picture or not. I can certainly pick out Ross, who was the first director, I think, right? Ross McGilvery. And this is when you all came when the building was being built. So there's a picture from 2003. Why am I blathering on? This is how long Kelly and my group and soon after Mike came uh, has been actually working on this thing. And you'll see some of the starts and stops. So what actually is this molecule? So it's a transmembrane single pass. It's a mucin, so it's got tons of glycosylation. That's what you're looking at, all these little black bars up here. They're the ones that are sticking straight out at 90 degree angles from the protein core. Those are O-glycosylations. Little triangles on the end, a lot of it's silated, so there's tons of negative charge. So when you have poto on poto, it's quite repulsive. Um, just um, because of all that negative charge, it'll push cells apart from each other. And uh, that's the situation in the kidney. And that's really what Kelly's lab uh, showed, at least in the kidney, what was going on. It's pushing the podocytes apart. And you actually have to do that. You got to get these little spaces between the podocytes so that you can actually make a filtration barrier. If not, the podocytes are all tight. There's tight junctions and Velcro that's holding them together. And you get no slit diaphragm formation. You get no urinary filter. Mice can't pee if you knock out the podo. And that's what Kelly's lab showed. So when I heard him give that talk, CBR or not, 20 some years ago, I thought, oh, wow, I wonder in tumor cells, because this is an important characteristic of tumor cells that they kind of have to push apart and let go of each other if they're going to metastasize and go to a new site. I went to Kelly and said, man, can I look on some tumors? And he got us some antibody from a collaborator named David Kershaw, who's off in Michigan. Um, there weren't very many protoclicks and antibodies at the time. And what we did was we got some tumor material in the form of the, some of the first tissue microarrays, in this case, a breast microarray, where you have arrayed on a slide, tumor cores, hundreds of tumor cores, where you've got all the pathologic data. So you know how uh, folks have responded, how they've done, and you can go back and look at the clinical correlation to get prognostic information. So sort of classic staining. So here's staining some breast tumors with hardly any poto. So the antibody against poto and then a brown chromophore. So you're looking at a tissue section of a little core of a breast tumor in this case. That's what we looked at first. And a bunch of them hardly have any poto. There's just a little bit of brown. You can see most of it's kind of on the surface. This is one where it's poto high. So you've got tons of protocolics in there, tons of this little mucin on the tumor cells. And then when you go back and do the clinical correlation analysis, you can generate curves. They're called Kaplan-Meier curves. Those are just the folks that usually did them. The survival versus time, for example, that's what you see here. And so what you have is that these guys that have tons of the protocolixin, there's a poor, it, there, it's an indicator of poor prognosis and it's an independent marker. So it doesn't go with some of the other ones you would know if, uh, uh, that you've heard about with breast cancer, like BRCA1 or HER2, for example, it's, it's, it's quite independent. So from that point of view, it's kind of interesting as a prognostic marker. And that kind of gave us the impetus to think about functionality. Well, it's there as a marker, but is it functionally important? And that goes back to this idea that I first had when we went and talked to Kelly about getting some antibody. And the important thing to remember is in most of, unlike liquid tumors, it's quite a different situation. In, mo in most solid tumors, the brain situation is a little different, but in most solid tumors, particularly in the breast, it's not the mass, right, that kills women. It's not the breast tumor that kills one. And these tumors form either from these little grape-like clusters, those are called the lobules, or these little um, tubes, those are the ducts. So you have two major types, lobular or ductal. Turns out that the poto is really prevalent in ductal tumors, which are the most prevalent type of tumor. But when you form a mass from those ductal cells in the breast, it's not gonna kill someone. What's gonna kill someone moving out from the mammogram is when it metastasizes. Right. So it has to get out of the tumor, the primary tumor in the breast, either in the vasculature, the blood vasculature, the lymphatics, move to a new site, get out of the vasculature, colonize the new site and expand there. So there's a whole series of steps that happens in this metastatic cascade that everybody's looking at. So there's the tumor forming, right? Mass proliferation, lower apoptosis, I don't think POTO is so important for that, although there's some evidence it can affect tumor growth. 
has to vascularize, and then the cells have to leave and become invasive, usually what's called localized invasion. And, and we know, and I'm gonna show you over the next few slides, that poto, overexpression of potocolixin can drive this in tumors, it can cause cells to push out of the primary mass and start to move out so that then they can do things like get into the circulation. And we have a collaborator now at Northwestern, Hu Ping Liu, who's really nicely shown that potocolixin is pretty important for survival in the vasculature because it can actually affect how the cells cluster. And when there's more little clusters, they survive. Uh, cells that come from solid tissues, unlike blood cells, hate to be on their own floating around in the blood. But if they can cluster together, they're happier. And in some situations, altered potocolixin can facilitate that. We're also looking at the other steps, right? So once it gets into the blood, it's got to move and the cells have to, tumor cells have to survive in the blood vasculation. Then they have to get out again. This is called extravasation. And that's an invasive process. And they have to colonize new sites in the distant site. In the case, like I showed you before, that was a liver met that you were looking at with a PET scan. You have to get into the liver tissue and invade there. So we're also exploring there. But what I'm going to tell you about now is just how functionally, how we've looked at what's going on in local invasion. So this is a nice, smooth-edged, non-invasive breast tumor, an experimental breast tumor in this case. And what you're seeing here is a nice, smooth edge of the tumor mass that we've made in an orthotopic transplantation model. So orthotopic just means you've gone back to the site where the original tumor forms. So this is actually in the mammary gland of a mouse. We've made these tumors and all this kind of scanty stuff. That's all the fat in, in the in the in the mammary gland. And in a non-pregnant mouse or a non-pregnant woman, that's most of what you see there. Those glandular elements that I showed you on the cartoon, they usually only expand at pregnancy and lactation. And then they involute. There's apoptosis that get, gets rid of them all. This is a lymph node just as a marker there. So nice, smooth edge. And these guys have very little potocolixin. And these are the cells that Aaron's worked with a lot. And then if we overexpress, force express potocolixin in these cells, this is what you get. So there's the primary tumor mass over there. There's the lymph node over there. There's the, all the fatty stuff, all the light stuff, because the fat gets extracted. And then you got all these little blobs, and this is tumor. And what this is, is small little buds, or sometimes large buds, pushing off of the primary tumor and becoming invasive. This is uh, classically called tumor budding, and I'll come back to that in a few minutes. But that's an invasive characteristic of tumor. So it's kind of that first step that I showed you in the cartoon a couple of slides ago. We can do that in vivo. We can model it in vitro. And this is really what my lab does. These are 3D organotypic cultures. So here we're making a, a little cluster of cells and they're held together with Velcro. And that's what you're seeing stained on in green there. That's a cell cell adhesion molecule that holds them all together in a nice little sphere. They're embedded in some matrix. It's a basement membrane like matrix. And here's the situation where we overexpress protoclicks, and these are the same cells that made the tumors in vivo. You get these little guys, these little buds pushing out of the sphere. And the spheres also elongate because they're pushing, they're becoming protrusive. There's some force activity there. Okay. I'm actually swiping some slides from Aaron here. So um, these are some movies that Aaron made to just to, to show you what's going on. And what she wanted to know, what Aaron was working on, is which domain of potocolixin is important for this protrusive invasive activity um, that we think is functionally important in the molecule. So here on the left, she's just got a little flag tag. This is a control that she's putting into the cells. And on the right, she's got flag tag poto, so she could show it. And this is full length poto. So that's the whole molecule, all the extracellular domain, the transmembrane domain. And what I didn't mention when I showed you the cartoon right in the first slide where the CBR folks were, where Ross McGilvery was, um, is that the cytoplasmic domain hooks up to the cytoskeleton. So we call it the, cyto the cytoplasmic tail. Okay, so here's the poto low cells. Oops, got to get the movie. Hey, the movie's not running now. Oh, this is terrible. Let go out. Yeah, it'll run now. So there's the little low guys. You can see they just kind of stay as little balls. Right? And here goes the ones where Aaron's force the total poto. You can see those little chains forming. They're pushing out, they're becoming protrusive, they're elongating. Some of these guys are out of the focus because they're up and down. There's some other guys as well. You can see the balls versus the elongated guys. So the 
full protoplexin drives this protrusive invasion that we could model both in vitro and we could see in vivo. So then, of course, what Erin did was she did the hard work <coughs> and made the mutations. Sorry, Aaron and Aiden, I'm just taking your time. All right. Here, here's quantification. So what Aaron's doing is she's watching this, she's watching the clusters over time. So going from zero minutes to 1200 minutes. Um, and there's what the full length photo where, you, where she's tracing what's happening with time. So the colors represent the, what's going on in time. And there's the guy where essentially, and what she really did, these are knockout reconstitution. So she's really, there's no poto in those little blobs. And then she's putting back the full length. Okay. So this is where I put years onto poor Aaron's life because I was convinced that the key element was going to be the cytoplasmic domain because that's what hooks up to the actin and that's what's going to drive all this invasive activity. So Aaron made the mutations and very careful together with Diana and in Kelly's lab. Um, and maybe even all the way back to Julie because you're the ones originally done the chicken, yeah, uh, and mouse. Um, and so what's going on here is we cut off the cytoplasmic tail that can interact with the cytoskeleton. She still gets lots of invasion. Cut off just a little bit. It's the very cytoplasmic bit. It connects up with some really promiscuous scaffolding proteins called nerve proteins that have PDZ domains for folks that are interested in those that connect up to the cytoskeleton. She still gets lots of invasion. These guys get all elongated. So she put in the extracellular domain where she took away the extracellular domain and nothing happens. They just sit there and they don't move. So it's really the extracellular domain that drives this activity. And a collaborator now, a, a guy named David Bryant, who's in Scotland, has actually shown the, the same thing. So we're really pretty convinced that the extracellular domain is really important. That's kind of exciting because it's way easier to target an extracellular domain than it is an intracellular domain for obvious reasons. Say with antibodies, you can get stuff to that domain, right? All right. So even though it was terrible for Aaron because I made her do all this extra work, uh, it's turned out to be an interesting story. All right. I've shown you this invasive phenotype, but what I haven't shown you is does poto really matter for metastasis, right? You could, you're just showing me squiggly lines in some weird 3D cultures. Does it matter for metastasis? So this is actually really worked that was spearheaded in Kelly's lab initially by, by Mike and uh, uh, Kim Snyder, who I mentioned in the acknowledgements. And of course, they took sort of an immunologist type approach, a competitive assay. And so what Mike... Uh, and Kim did was they labeled cells, either high poto expressing cells. This is now a really aggressive breast tumor cell line that we're going to come back to when Aiden talks in a minute, um, that either are poto high or where poto's knocked down. And the high ones are red and the low ones are green. You put them into the animal and then you look to see what goes, what metastasizes, and then you look for more red versus more green or the other way around. And the expectation here would be poto high, you'd say you'd see way more red cells than green cells, right? And we looked, uh, they looked in liver. There's the situation, poto high, lots of red signal, lots of red cells, lots of metastasizing cells forming metastatic lesions and the same in the lungs. So that was, that, that was a, a really uh, nice and important experiment. All right, so. Uh, if you look back, if, you, if you're an expert at looking at the Kaplan-Meier curves, one thing you might have noticed was that those poto highs in breast cancer was, wasn't a very large proportion of the tumors. So we had this interesting phenomenon. We'd worked out the functional data, but, uh, you know, how clinically applicable was it if you're only going to target 10 or 15% of breast tumors? You could argue those are the bad ones. It's worth really looking at, but we decided to look at other tumor types. And one of the ones we looked at were, uh, was ovarian carcinoma. And we looked at, particularly, it turns out the poto is really highly expressed in high-grade serous ovarian carcinoma, which is the bad ones. These are the ones you hear about when folks are diagnosed. Um, they're quite deadly. Um, and poto is actually expressed in 90, over, highly expressed in 90% of those tumors. So that's become the tumor type that we've worked with a lot more 
uh, more recently. Um, and there's Diana, uh, who I mentioned at the beginning from Kelly's lab. And uh, we'd first looked at it with Jane Cipollone in, in my lab a, a number of years ago. So we're working away on ovarian, and I'm not gonna tell you too much about our ovarian projects at the, today. Um, but at the same time, of course, you kind of grouse about it when it happens because you're worried about getting scooped. But at the same time, lots of other people were starting to look at as well. And it turns out to be gratifying because it, the, the real story now looks like this. So protocolics and overexpression associated with poor prognosis is in all these and actually more now uh, tumor types. So all kinds of solid tumor types. We're now working on uh, endometrial tumors with the group here, the gynecologic cancer initiative group and Jess Jessica McAlpine here in town, but also bladder, kidney, as you might expect. So renal carcinoma, uh, given the importance of, of poto in the kidney, prostate, uh, turns out in squamous cell tumors in the, in the esophagus, these are HPV driven tumors, um, gastric carcinoma, colorectal. And now we've become quite interested in pancreatic um, for reasons I'll show you in a second. And, and Aaron's done a lot of work here, essentially doing similar things that we've done in breast and ovary, but also in the pancreas to show its functional importance. Um, the pancreatic ductal lung, glioblastoma, which is quite a different beast. In this case, what happens in the brain is bad, but even there it's the invasion that becomes important because it threads out and becomes invasive in, in, uh, in glioblastoma and also astrocytoma. And Mike now, um, uh, working with folks at BC Cancer is actually looking at some liquid tumors. So extracellular domain, functionally important, lots of tumor types, make antibodies, right? Before I get there, I just wanna show you the situation in pancreatic. So this is, um, remember I mentioned what we were modeling in those uh, transplantation assays where you saw those blobs in the breast tumors? Well, clinically, there's a good correlate with that. And these are called these tumor buds. These are little clusters of cells that come off the primary tumors. And David Schaefer, who uh, um, works on pancreatic carcinoma here in town at VGH, had actually looked at that specifically where this is just an, a pathologic correlate. They're just looking for these little clusters or buds that come off the primary tumor. And when they score tumors low on buds or high on buds, the high on bud tumors do much more poorly. So it's a similar correlation with what you saw with podocolixin. There's already a correlation with podocolixin itself. So Aaron looked in the buds and looked for poto in these clinical tumors. And that's what you see. So what she's outlined with dotted lines here, this is actually the tumor. And these are all these little buds that cluster out, which she's marked with arrowheads. And you can see the, these little clusters of cells. So lots of different tumor types, extracellular domain. I'm going too long, aren't I? Oh, I better end pretty soon. It's okay. Um, um, functionally important. Can we target it by making antibodies? that'll bind to the extracellular domain. So that's what we did with the folks at CDRD. So this is Mike's great schematic about how we did this. We actually took a glioblastoma line that has tons of podocolixin on the surface. And we used that as an immune engine in rabbits and then used uh, John Babcook and CDRD and something he developed back with Amgen a number of years ago, all the way back to John Schrader's lab, this SLAM technology where you can actually pull out B cells um, and millions of them and rapidly screen um, to find things that will bind and, and bind to poto. And in this case, we were binding to cell surface poto, so extracellular domain. Um, and we, we went from looking at millions of initial uh, B cells down to about 200 B cell clones that were expanded and made antibody to, um, and then got down to about 30 candidates that Mike and Kim initially characterized after I actually did some work, which was to screen them in vitro to look at functional assay in vitro. And the assay we use, remember I told you that POTO is kind of a repulsive molecule when there's tons of it on the surface. What it will do is it'll affect adhesion to substrate. So cells that have tons of POTO to them don't like to stick to tissue culture plates or fibronectin much. But if you block, if you have a blocking antibody, the idea was you'd, you'd block that anti-adhesive effect. And that's how we initially characterized them in vitro. 
uh, to be potentially functionally important. And then Mike and Kim did almost exactly the same experiment they did with the knockdown experiment, but with a bunch of with this bunch of antibodies. And that's a, so this is one of the first experiments, I think, Mike, if I remember correctly. So what uh, Mike and Kim did was they coated tumor cells with antibodies, and then we stuck them into mice, and then we looked to see how well they, they made tumors. And what happens is with this one particular antibody, and we just numbered them initially, how they came off the initial plates where we stuck them into wells to, to expand them. Um, this was POTO83. And these, these are all monoclonals now. Um, and what happens here with POTO83, instead of getting this growth of tumors, you get very little growth of tumor when we pre-coat. They also looked at metastasis. So now what they're doing is they're labeling all the tumor cells green with GFP. And then rather than doing the competition high and low, what they're doing is now they're putting in the antibody and they're looking to see what happens with metastasis. In this case to the lungs, this is with an antibody control, lots of green, lots of metastasis. This is with these aggressive cells with the antibody, much less metastasis. And this is it quantified here with this antibody. So we've got an antibody that binds to the extracellular domain. I'll show you where in a second of protoclyxin. And it has this function blocking activity in vivo against tumor growth and metastasis. Fantastic, we're off to the races. Except, except, don't forget there's tons of normal protoclyxin in really important places. I told you about kidney, but it's also on a lot of small vascular uh, profile endothelial cells. Um, so that's a bit of an issue. But what protoclyxin 83, poto 83 binds to is actually the core protein outside the mucin domain. So way in the stock up close to the membrane, poto 83 binds there. And what that means is it binds to all poto. So what you're seeing here is it's binding to normal. Uh, these are the podocytes in the little glomeruli in the kidney. And you can also see it binding to these endothelial cells in these small uh, vessels that wrap around the kidney tubules, so-called straight tubules, right? So we're a little worried about that from the point of view of sticking it into people and causing problems in the kidneys, but Mike's got a strategy. I should also say these antibodies that we made, we, we purposefully made them to be human specific. Um, so what Mike's now done, Mike and Julianne uh, have knocked in the human gene into the mouse locus and we've made mice and now we're characterizing what's going on in mice that have the human protoclicks. But Mike can tell you about that when you invite him back to talk about what he's doing there. All right, so we're a little worried about this antibody being therapeutically useful. It can be useful for other things. It can be useful for imaging, which we've done a little bit with Francois Bernard. We've stuck radio ligands onto this and you, you can follow tumors around. Um, and we also have some other strategies to hopefully ameliorate this problem. But that got us thinking, in tumors, these glycodomains are often altered. The glycosylation itself is often altered. And there's kind of a whole, there's groups out there chasing this. Um, most notably, the folks that have made the original cars, um, they're, um, they're actually chasing these as well to try and find antibodies that will find tumor-specific glycoepitopes on cell surface molecules. So given all that we'd already done with POTO, we went back to the original antibody screen, and now we screened for things that would bind to POTO on tumor cells, but wouldn't bind normal cells that had POTO on them. And we found one best antibody that we're working with now called potocolixin 447 and Pam together with Mike and other folks and now Lydia have been working on this a lot. And as well as you're gonna see Aaron and uh, Aiden in just a second, right? So this is a different antibody. And it nicely sees uh, quite a good percentage of tumors. In this case, these are our ovarian tumors. So you can see the brown stuff on the surface. Sometimes we get a little bit of intracellular staining. So we went back to a tissue microarray array of 158 tumors. We see it on about two thirds of the tumors. Not as high as I told you with total potal because it's 90%, but it's a goodly proportion. And again, these are the bad tumors. So if you could target anything with an antibody that doesn't see normal tissues with this antibody, it could be very useful. And it does not. 
So this is a stain with the POTO83 of the kidney. This is a stain with the POTO447 of the kidney. It doesn't stain in the kidney and it doesn't stain pretty much anywhere else. We see a little bit, it's a bit problematic in some areas in the head, but we're working on that. Um, and 447, Pam originally characterized, binds to the glycodomain. And that's then when we worked with the folks um, in uh, Denmark to figure out really what it was binding. And they had some nice tricks, some nice glycobiologic tricks to, to figure out what that was. So this is the normal situation. What happens is all these O-linked carbohydrates, they're long and they're branched and they're often capped with sialic acids. What the 447 is binding to, it's binding to a stubby little disaccharide together with the peptide. Um, so that's why it's a glycopeptide binding together with the peptide and binding there. And this, these stubby guys only get made in tumors. And this is because uh, some of the glycotransferases get messed up that stick on the new sugars and ultimately stick on the sialation. So that's what 447 is recognizing. It's recognizing a, essentially a crippled glycopeptide on the surface of, of these tumor cells. So what we really wanted to do is now we had something that was tumor specific. Um, what we've done is we've made an antibody drug conjugate. So this is a prototype now. Now we're working to make it better. And I can tell you about that today. And again, Mike can tell you about that when he comes back because Mike and Pam are really working hard on this. So what we've done is uh, this is kind of the classic way to do it. You have linkers and uh, you have linkers that are coming off usually the non-business in terms of the CDR end of the antibody you link to some kind of toxic payload. And so the whole idea here is, in this case, we're, what we've put on is a taxol-like molecule that disrupts the microtubules. You can have other things that intercalate into the DNA um, that cause DNA uh, strand breaks, for example. And the idea here is you're gonna get these things bound, the antibody binding, in this case, to the potoclixin, you get internalization, and it goes through the endosomal lysosomal pathway. You have a cleavable linker that gets cleaved by the lysosomal enzymes and the change of pH and releases the payload into the cells. And so that's what we've done in pancreatic tumors. And this is really a work that Diana started in Kelly's lab. And now Pam and Julianne are working on. What you're seeing are the growth of pancreatic tumors in one of these transplantation models with a control ADC or much better and much better survival with an ADC that is POTO specific with this 4478. All right. So that's really what we're spending a lot of our time on. Um, now, fine tuning this ADC, looking at it in other indications, because ultimately we'd like to get it to people um, with given this tumor specificity. But, and this is an interesting thing, this is something that Aaron looked at, which is you got this weird glycoepitope. Pep, uh, I used to call it a peptidoglycan before a microbiologist got mad at me and said, that's not right, because you only get that with bacterial peptides that are glycosylated. So it's a glycopeptide. When, that, when you have this weird crippling on the surface of the cells, does it matter phenotypically? And so that's what Aaron's going to tell you about. Um, is it functionally relevant? Does it, the cells that have this epitope on it, are they different than cells that don't? Even cells that already have POTO on them. And what Aiden's going to tell you about is a project we started with this fellow across the street, Simon Wisnowski, is um, what regulates um, whether POTO's on the surface or not. So we got a strategy there, a CRISPR-based strategy. So I'm going to turn it over to Erin now, who's going to tell you about how she looked to see cells that do have that 447 epitope or don't have that 447 epitope, uh, whether they're different. All right. Um... So as Cal mentioned, I was interested in looking at whether there was, <coughs> sorry, I'm getting over a cold, <laughs> whether there was a functional relevance for expression of the POTO447 epitope. And because we're not able to modulate its expression at this point, we needed a cell line that had um, expression of total potocolixin, but a stable heterogeneous expression of POTO447. So we found the pancreatic cancer cell line CFPAC1 fit this profile. And we were able to sort out uh, POTO447 low and POTO447 high population by facts. And then we then confirmed these newly sorted populations by flow. So all expressing total potocolixin or POTO83 with one of our, our first antibody. 
And then um, heterogeneous expression of proto-447, so 447 low and 447 high populations. So then I sent these samples for RNA sequencing and Stefan with the bioinformatics core performed the differential expression analysis. And what we can see from the RNA-seq data is that the proto-447 high cells expressed uh, highly a number of genes that were associated with an EMT. So things like vimentin and key regulators, twist, zeb, and snail. Now, a classical EMT um, describes the process where epithelial cells lose their epithelial characteristics, specifically things like the cell-cell junctions based on E cadherin, as well as uh, cytokeratin intermediate fil filaments. And they acquire more mesenchymal traits. So things like the expression of n cadherin as well as single cell motility. And while we did see overexpression of n cadherin in the POTO447 high cells, we didn't see any differential expression of E cadherin, which we would have expect expected to be transcriptionally repressed in EMT. So this suggested to us that maybe the POTO447 epitope was associated more with a partial EMT. And a partial EMT describes the state where cells retain some of their epithelial features and they invade typically as a collective. So by that mode of collective invasion and tumor budding that Cal described earlier. Um, so we can see this partial EMT phenotype morphologically when we looked at the cells uh, just in 2D culture. The CFPAC1 uh, parental cells are pretty heterogeneous, but generally they're epithelial. And you can see even more strikingly, the POTO447 low cells <clears throat> form these um, compact islands and sheets, epithelial-like structures in 2D culture. However, the POTO447 high population um, had more of a quasi-mesenchymal phenotype. So you can see a number of spindle-like single cells, but with some loose cohesive uh, islands. So they're retaining some of their epithelial features. And now given this morphological difference, I was interested in validating um, some of the gene products that came up in RNA-seq. And I first wanted to focus on things involved in cell-cell adhesion. So in line with the RNA-seq data, I looked at total um, protein expression of n cadherin, and we can see that in POTO447 high cells, n cadherin is overexpressed compared to the low cells. And the same phenotype is seen when we looked at um, surface surface expression of N-cadherin by flow. So you can see in green here, um, N-cadherin is higher at the surface of 447 positive cells. Again, in line with the RNA-seq data, we didn't see any difference in total expression of E-cadherin between the two populations. However, interestingly, when we looked at surface expression of E-cadherin by flow, we saw that uh, the POTO447 low cells in purple here had higher surface E cadherin expression than um, the POTO447 high cells. So this suggests that it may, may be um, a localization shift of E cadherin. So going from the surface to um, intracellular, and that sort of uh, fits with the partially EMT um, morphology that we were seeing. And this localization change can further be shown by immunofluorescence. So we're looking here in POTO447 low cells, we have junctional E cadherin in green. But when we look at the POTO447 high cells, you see a loss of this uh, junctional E cadherin marked by its accumulation in the cytoplasm, coupled with an increased expression of N cadherin at cell-cell junctions in gray. So what we've shown you so far is that our POTO447 antibody recognizes a glycopeptide epitope on protocolixin. And what I've just shown you is that um, POTO447 high cells express high levels of N cadherin with a reduced level of junctional E cadherin. We also see overexpression of a number of genes from the um, uh, heat map that I showed earlier that suggests that POTO447 might be involved in increasing uh, invasion, matrix remodeling, and metastasis, as well as some early data suggesting that they may have a survival advantage uh, in circulation. So ultimately, we hope that our POTO447 antibody will act to block some of these functional effects and improve um, disease outcome, reduce invasion, reduce metastasis. But what we can't um, show from this data is whether EMT is a driver of the POTO447 epitope expression or if it's an effect of that 
or whether PUT0447 is just sort of a passive marker of uh, more aggressive phenotypes. So in order to clarify this, we really need to understand how the PUT0447 epitope emerges. Um, so as Cal sort of touched on earlier, I'll just go in a little more detail with the, the epitope. We were working with Ola Blixt in uh, Denmark to show that the POTO447 antibody recognizes an epitope in the extracellular domain, and more specifically, that it is um, likely to be this core 1T antigen, um, recognizing uh, this antigen in respect with the peptide backbone of photocolexin. So the core 1T antigen is an unsilated O glycoprotein. So um, it's covalently linked to serine and threonine residues by activity of a number of glycosyl transferases, including uh, T synthase and cosmic, which is its chaperone protein. And based on this glycan modification, we would expect that changes or like a loss of the T synthase or loss of um, cosmic would result in a reduction in potential and binding because you'd get the formation of the TN antigen, which is even further truncated. And to the contrary, if we lose this sial transferase st 3 gal one we would expect to have an increase in POTO447 binding, um, meaning that we're not getting this terminal sialic acid residue added um, to the core T antigen. And this is something that Cal touched on earlier. Our um, collaborators in Chicago have shown that hyposilation, so the loss of this um, sialic acid residue has a role in um, promoting cell dissemination and circulation by um, favoring the clustering of circulating tumor cells. So that actually seems to fit with the partially MT gene signature that we, we have found. So I think that's something that we're kind of working on now to try and um, further flesh it out. But ultimately, I'll turn it over to Aiden. He's going to explain a bit about the project we're doing with Simon Wisnowski to figure out what actually regulates, so what genes and what pathways regulate expression of the POTO447 epitope. Yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the work I've been doing the last month, as well as the work we've done in the past few months, working with this Wisnowski lab. So here we're looking at what's regulating the POTO447 binding epitope. Um, so the first thing we did is we collaborated with the Wisnowski lab to perform a CRISPR-wide, I mean, a genome-wide CRISPR-I knockdown screen. So here we basically, we generated all these lentiviral particles by packaging in these guide RNAs that would target like every gene in the genome multiple times, so genomic-wide. Then we infect these into our MDA231 cells, which Cal mentioned a little bit earlier. And these MDA231 cells express this version of the Cas9 enzyme that's a little different, which makes it different from your classical CRISPR screen. So here you've got your Cas9 enzyme, but they've, we've removed the domain that is performing the actual cutting. So it's like deactivated. It still recognizes that guide and binds to the re region of the genome. But then we've added this crab domain as well, which then represses the gene rather than cutting it and knocking it out. So it's a knockdown rather than a knock. It's a knockdown rather than a knockout, per se. And then once we did, got these MDA231 cells with these knockdowns, we performed some flow, and we sorted for the highest as well as the lowest. As we can see here, these are, and then these were we chose with the POTO447 as well as the POTO83 to control for the total POTO. And then we were able to extract out these guides and find out like what genes are playing a role in impacting the 83 and 447 pending, I'll show on the next slide. So here we have the total poto binding. Total poto binding, that's using our 83 antibody, which Cal mentioned targets the, every type of, every poto clicks and not just the ones with poto 447 would be recognizing. And doing, digging through the data in a little bit, we were able to choose 11 genes of interest, which we are now choosing to create individual knockdown lines for. To, uh, to validate the regulation of the POTO447 epitope and the POTO447 associated phenotype. And some of these genes include POTO clixin itself, which we can see in the double, double negative region down here, where it's very, very low in the POTO447 binding, as well as the POTO83 binding. And then in addition to POTO clixin itself, which we can use for control. 
control. We've also knocked out some of the glycotransferase controls, which Aaron mentioned earlier, such as SC3-GAL1, C1-GALPC1. C1. And then we chose a bunch of those which are invo involved in tumor progression and the EMT, such as TGF-BR3, GSK-3B, LEMD3, BRAF, and CMTM3. And then we also found some more interesting ones, such as DA1, DET1, which are involved in the COP1 E3 ligase complex. And then we also found LAMTOR5, which is a part of the TOR complex. And we can see these all mapped out here on this 447 and 483 binding. And so this is the stuff that I've been doing over the last few weeks, which is generating these lines and for the sake of validating the potential for POTO 447 regulating genes. So these knockdown guides that we got from our screen, we ind I individually clone them into the guide RNA vectors. So cloning it into the vector, packaging it up into the lentivirus, which is we're doing with collaboration with Jimmy Kim over at the Wisnowski lab, and then transducing them into the MDA231 cells to generate our knockdown cell lines with the individual guides. And then these cells, once they're generated over the next few weeks, will then be assessed for the knockdown, photo447 and 83 binding, and then changes in the photo447 associated gene signature. That's it. So thanks again to the CVR as well as all of our collaborators. It wouldn't be possible without the CVR. I think I shouldn't ask because I heard the story already. But uh, it's so interesting to hear the ACD447, uh, the, it works. Uh, so basically the tumor kind of uh, smaller, but it's the primary tumor. I'm just wondering, have you ever tried if the tumor metastasis already and give it this antibody, does the uh, treatment still work? Yeah, so one thing I should make really clear that I didn't. So the the eighty the, the original antibody that recognizes all podocolixin, that's what we've done with the, it acts as a naked antibody. So the, the 447 has very little, at least we haven't been able to find any mic unless I'm missing something. It, it alone doesn't have any activity. So that's why we had to make it into the drug conjugate. So you're asking the question, have we done the metastasis assays yet with that ADC? We just haven't done them yet. Yeah. It's, a, it, it's an interesting issue. Um, one thing we have done is going back to clinical variant samples after they've been treated. So one of the reasons why we're, we're focusing on the ovarian carcinoma situation is it turns out those really bad tumors, they originally get hammered um, with anthracyclines and, and platinum and cisplatinum, and they're initially responsive. So they shrink they go away for a little while and then they come back and then they're completely non-responsive and very aggressive. And we have looked at those tumors, those clinical tumors that have been treated, Pam's actually done that. And they're still 447 positive and positive. So we're hoping to be able to treat those post-treatment, second line treatment, essentially, those post-treatment guys that don't respond because no one's gonna change that, uh, that essentially frontline practice because they do respond, but then they're initially resistant. So that's what we're trying to target there. Yeah, but the Mets, we just haven't done. There's a question at the back, I think. No. Oh, I thought you had a question. Ed. So what else does podocolixin associate with on the cell surface? Certainly, this is going to tell us more about how it's doing what it's doing. Yeah, how it's working. So this is this is an interesting question, and Mike, Mike, you can jump in because there are there are some situations where it will bind, where it has the where it will bind to some selectins, depending on what's going on with the silation. So there's there's some effect there. So that could be part of what's going on in the vasculature. What's going on in, for example, our 3D culture assays is not clear because those are kind of cell autonomous effects. Now, whether it's interacting with something on the cells of the tumor cells themselves, 
this guy that I mentioned who's in Scotland has some data that Poto can actually oligomerize with itself. And so that may be some of the function, but going after bona fide protoclicks and ligands in the tumor microenvironment hasn't been done. And it's something we have to do. Mike, I don't know if, if you want to speak to that because you've thought hard about this. No, it's really hard. Yeah. So, yeah. So it's going to be important to do. One of my favorite proteins, tissue factor, the initiator of coagulation is on every single tumor metastasis and is linked to met metastasis in ovarian cancer and also breast cancer. And you know, I bet you if we did a co-stain, we'd find it right we'd beside find it each there. other. I mean, that, I mean, I mean, this is, so, so, so the, the, the group that's working on this in with circulating tumor cells, I mean, they actually came to us because what they did was they screened what was on the surface of clustered breast tumor cells in the vasculature. So they're actually taking them out of patients. The way people normally do this is they would pull single cells because that's what they would do in the flow. Um, and they wouldn't really find any phenotypic differences. There was no good correlation between single cells, whether they they were associated with more metastasis or not. What these folks did was they pulled clustered cells. And when they pulled those clustered cells, they looked at them first and there was a way less silation. And then there was lots of poto. And so they wanted the function blocking antibodies because we'd already published it. So that's why we're collaborating with them now. But they haven't looked to see what else they're associating with in the vasculature. So platelets, I'm sure, also associated with poor prognostic factors, things like what you're talking about. We'll just take some antibody and we'll stain them. It'd be great, it'd be cool. Yeah. We're all, always looking for the cofactors, yeah. Yeah, be fun. Lynn's been bugging us with Hugh to also look at with the platelets also, yeah. Yeah, but we can first see if there's correlation in the vasculature, for example, because we're getting now, we're going to be able to get cells from there. Yeah. Coda. So in tumor cells, there are two things that are different in terms of the product. Uh, one is expression. Yeah. Two, glycation. Yeah. Do you know which one is more important? Yeah. Uh, from a functional point of view? Well, we actually, I'll be, I'll, I'll be super honest. We don't know that the 447 glycosylation is functionally important. We, 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 we just don't know that yet. Um, we've got correlations and, and Aaron worked hard to show what, what that phenotype is with. Um, of course, we have to look in more tumor types and lines. That's an important thing to keep in mind. That's one of the reasons why we wanted to do the reg regulation with Simon. So when we regulate that epitope, do we see a change in phenotype? So we don't know that for sure. We do know that the overexpression is functionally important. More poto, more virulent, essentially. What regulates that? It's not amplification. At least in breast, we looked really hard. Huntsman's group did a lot of fish. That's not what's going on. Um, there's some transcriptional regulation that's going on there. We think it's probably post-transcriptional. The three, three prime untranslated region is really important. And we learned this because when we were originally doing the expression overexpression screens, when we still had three prime UTR on there, we could never get overexpression. There's lots of SIs, that, there's lots of small guys that bind down there. So we think that's probably what's going on. Yeah, uh, it's gonna be, I would imagine it's going to be hugely variable. So for example, oxygen tension will regulate poto, as you might expect in the kidney. There's some hormonal responsiveness. So there's some estrogen responsiveness, for example, in breast. It's going to be multifactorial. So it, it, and stability is an issue too, right? When you're trying to develop therapeutics. That's why it was important that we could see post-treatment, we could still see the epitope. Sorry, no blood. Next time. Next time we'll have blood stuff. Mike. Sorry, 
Mike's asking, did we try the antibody on the 3D uh, video cultures? Yeah, I'm just for the Zoom. There's a few. There's a few people on Zoom. Yeah. Any Zoom questions? If you have them, you can just unmute if you want. No. Okay. okay, I think we're done. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having us. I guess we'll see you on August 15th when, when Aiden will update you what's going on with the knockdowns. <laughs>